In this lesson, we'll understand what is meant by the term protocol and how that relates to the concept of a standard. We'll also start considering how many functions have to be performed to interoperate systems and how these functions might be organized. I think some definitions are in order. What is a protocol? Well, we use the term protocol in the data communications business the same way it's used in the diplomacy business. It's a plan for how two different systems are going to interact. In diplomacy, protocol officers get together in advance and hammer out the plan. It says who's going to greet whom at the bottom of the steps of the aircraft, what color the carpet is going to be, what music the band will be playing, are you allowed to be sitting down while the President of the United States is in the room? It's the plan on how two countries will interact. To communicate, we need to have a set of conventions that specifies how we're going to communicate. This is the definition of a protocol. Mutual adherence to an agreed protocol or set of protocols makes communication possible. In an open system, the protocols are published standards. Everyone agrees on the protocols to be used. Quite a number of areas and functions must be covered in a communication protocol. Taking email as an example, first we have to agree on what the format of the message will be. How will the message be coded into ones and zeros? Will it then be encrypted? We better have an agreed plan for how we're going to do encryption or we're not going to be doing a whole lot of communications. Most communications today is client-server and email is an easy example. When checking Outlook type email, it's necessary to log on to your mail server with a username and password and be authenticated. So part of the protocol has to be how to transmit usernames and passwords to the server. One could imagine the mind-numbing complexities created if it's desired that the password not be transmitted in the clear, but instead the password encrypted as a measure against eavesdropping. The question then is how to transmit the decryption key for the password without encrypting it. Once authenticated, then it's necessary to transport the message from the server to the client. And there are quite a number of things that have to be figured out. We have to be able to perform segmentation and reassembly, which means breaking the message up into manageable pieces for transmission and putting it back together at the receiver in the correct order. We have to be able to encapsulate control information on the segment. Sometimes we put the control information on the front, and sometimes we also put control information on the back of the segment, but usually it's just on the front. An example of control information encapsulated on a segment of data is a network address. Once we make a packet with a network address, how are routers going to make routing decisions based on those network addresses? Probably the most important aspect in the whole story is error control. I would claim that sending data with errors and not knowing about it is probably worse than not sending any data at all. Sometimes error control is performed on individual links, sometimes not, and you never know, so we always end up having to check errors end-to-end, -end, asking the far end, did you get that chunk of data, yes or no? We have to figure out how to do flow control, and that's when one system can't process information as fast as another and has to have a way of temporarily interrupting the flow of data. And then there's access control. When there's more than one station on the link and there's contention, who gets to go next? Even at the lowest level, the bit level, there are things that have to be resolved. What physical medium to use and how to represent the bits on the physical medium. And if I think that turning the light on means a 1, and you think that turning the light on means a 0, we're not going to be doing a whole lot of communications. We have to be able to do conversions between different media and different bit rates. All of this and more has to be part of the plan. There are two basic choices to come up with a plan, monolithic or structured protocols. A monolithic protocol would embody all of the required functions in a single standard. 
The problem with this approach is it becomes unwieldy when all possible variations are included in the single package and it makes maintenance impossible. A structured approach where we divide the totality of functions into easy pieces and then write protocols covering each of the pieces is much more workable. This allows us to mix and match. For example, we could keep everything the same on all the systems but allow different locations to employ different types of local cabling and framing. It would be possible for an individual to develop a set of open, structured protocols for communications. This would only be useful if everyone, or at least a critical mass of users, agreed to use that particular set of protocols. So we're always interested in implementing standard protocols. A protocol is a plan. A standard is when everybody agrees to a particular plan. In this lesson we defined the term protocol and how it's used in the communications business to mean a plan for how information will be exchanged. We began considering all of the functions that must be part of the protocol, including message format, coding, authentication, reliable communications, and and packets, routing, and communications on a single circuit. We understood the maintenance and flexibility advantages of defining a structured set of protocols instead of a single monolithic protocol, and defined a standard as being a protocol everyone agrees to.